to introduce it, um, it's going to be about smartphones and the effect on the brain and how they distract us. And I'll mention the um, State University of California. Let me see what else is there. There's Dr. Theo Compernola. So that's spelled C-O-M-P-E-R-N-O-L-L-E, Dutch name, I guess. And I'll um, talk about a study that was carried out there by this doctor. And um, there are certain parts of the brain, which I'm going to mention, mention there's three of them. The reflex part of the brain, the reflecting part of the brain, and the archiving part. I think that's about it. So I'll begin. Dear colleagues, I'm sure that like me, you will all have checked your phones already today. You'll have probably received a few text messages, maybe some phone calls as well. You may have responded to a few emails during your lunch break. And perhaps uh, when you got up this morning, you watched the TV. It's true that technology now dictates a lot of what we pay our attention to. This is a major change that's come in in the past two to three decades. Never before have we had so many different forms of technology which are demanding our attention on a daily, even hourly basis. So how do we handle these changes to our society and how do we get a grip on our own thoughts and our actions and what we allow ourselves to be distracted by? What is really going on in our brain when we're checking our phones or responding to an email? Where I live in Brussels, I constantly see people on the metro or the tram checking their phones. Perhaps they're waiting for a bus, they take the opportunity to reply to a text message. And studies show that increasing numbers of us even check our mobiles when we're sitting on the loo. So you can see that it's a real addiction and it's becoming a real problem. Previously, we would have had moments of silence in our day where we would have just relaxed, but now we're using those few precious minutes to watch funny videos on YouTube or to see what our virtual friends have been up to. Scientists at the California State University decided to investigate what effect all of this technology is having on our brains and they published a paper three years ago which displayed the results of uh, students studying in their own rooms and using technology. They monitored via cameras and through the uh, computer activity of these students, uh, 300 different students. So they were studying in their own rooms on campus for a period of 15 minutes at a time and the scientists were able to log what the students were doing every minute for those 15 minutes. They were able to see whether the students were reading a book, reading articles online or uh, writing and how often they turned away to uh, check their mobile phones, whether an email notification popped up and so on. They also investigated whether the students were watching TV at the same time as studying or indeed listening to music or perhaps even playing a quick game of something on the internet. Pokemon wasn't invented yet but uh, there are of course several other games that you can play. And the results of this study are quite surprising. The scientists found that on average students could only concentrate for three minutes fully on their important study tasks such as reading or writing. They were constantly getting distracted, particularly by their mobile phones and notifications on their computer screens telling them that they had a Facebook message, a tweet or an email. And what's more, the exam results of these students were also monitored and it was found that those who used technology the most frequently and who were most distracted by emails and bleeps of all kinds um, were likely to have the poorest results in their exams. There was a strong correlation, therefore, between high technology use and poor exam results. Dr. Theo Companola, who is one of the uh, psychologists involved in the study, has suggested a reason why this might be the case. And he linked the trend to the different parts of the brain 
that are used for different activities. There are three parts which he has described. The first part of the brain is called the reflex brain, and this is the most primitive part of our brain. It is a neural system which detects our senses, it controls our senses such as smell, sound and so on. And this part of the brain responds very rapidly. So if there is a, a, a sound in our environment, this is the part of the brain that makes us prick our ears up and pay attention. This was a very important part of our instinct for our ancestors living in the wilderness. It was the part of the brain that um, activates the survival instinct. So when there were predators around, this would have warned uh, early humans that they had to get out of the way. Nowadays, the reflex brain has to cope with a lot more functions, and that's why it can get distracted when we have uh, phones bleeping or, or uh, when we're using our computers. The second part of the brain is called the reflecting brain, and this part is mainly used for analysing, for imagining, and for creative thinking. So alarm bells sound as well when this part of the brain is interrupted. There's, we, we probably have all heard of the stereotype that men can't multitask, that women are better at multitasking than men. But in fact, for both sexes, it's the reflecting part of the brain that can't multitask. It can only focus on one activity at a time. The study found that for every 30 second distraction that we, um, that we have when we're reading a text message or playing a game, it takes two minutes of repair time for our reflecting brain to get back into gear and to start functioning normally again. The third and last part of the brain is uh, called the archiving brain. And this is also distracted by sensory information. It's a part of the brain that's active when we are resting. So for example, when we're waiting for a bus, um, when we're in the lift, standing in line to get a coffee, on the toilet, waiting for a friend somewhere, or even playing with children. But nowadays we get uh, little rest because we're using all of these opportunities, all of these little time slots when we would otherwise have been resting and processing to check our phones or to, to read an email. We don't have any downtime anymore. We see these moments in the day as wasted time if we're not chatting with someone on Messenger and so on. But really, this isn't wasted time at all. It's very important for our brain to have that time to repair. It's a bit like your mobile phone, which is updating things in the background. We need that background processing to be going on in our brains to make sense of what we've seen and heard during the day. So we might feel as though we're being more efficient if we um, respond to a message while we're waiting in line for a coffee but it actually helps us if we have brain breaks if we take regular breaks to allow our brain to function and we just sit for a moment in silence these brain breaks help us to be more creative they help us to improve our memory and they also give us a feeling of more peacefulness they help us to relax Dr. Komponola therefore advises that we go offline regularly. We need to have unplugged times during the day, especially if we are doing tasks which we need to concentrate on, such as studying or, dare I say, interpreting or translating. Further studies have shown that many of us work best in the morning. So this uh, suggests the Dr. Komponola is the best time to unplug and to spend some time away from social media and our mobiles. I know that for our industry, for translation and interpreting, it can be difficult to do this because clients often want a rapid response. If they send us a request, they might need to know within an hour whether we can accept it or not. So it's difficult for us to turn off our emails and uh, our, our phones in case we might miss out on work. But we do need to disconnect in order to reflect and process. Maybe we should look more at the question of why we want these constant distractions in our life. Is it because we find life too difficult to deal with, real life that is, and we prefer to stay in the virtual world with our virtual friends? Do we want to avoid looking at the world and seeing all of these uh, pieces of bad news coming up? 
the philosopher uh, Nietzsche said that it was because when we were um, alone, we are afraid that in the stillness, in the quiet, we will hear things that we don't want to hear. We'll start to have thoughts and feelings that we don't like. So we hate quietness and we try to deafen ourselves with uh, sociability. I want to finish with a little quiz to see um, whether or not you are addicted to your smartphone. And it's made up of a number of questions that I'll just run through quickly. And if you answer yes to 10 or more of these questions, apparently that means that it's very likely you're addicted to your smartphone. So the first question, do you feel uncomfortable without constant access to information on your smartphone? Question two, are you irritated if you can't look up information whenever you want to? Three, when you can't read the news constantly, such as the weather and current affairs, do you get nervous? Four, are you irritated when, you're, uh, when you can't use your smartphone and the functions of your smartphone whenever you want? Five, do you feel scared if your smartphone battery runs down? Six, if you um, exceed your monthly data limit, do you start panicking? Seven, if you can't get a Wi-Fi signal or a data signal, do you constantly uh, keep running around looking for a signal or for a network connection? Eight, if you can't use your smartphone, are you afraid of getting lost somewhere because you're so reliant on your GPS? Nine, if you can't check your smartphone for a while, do you constantly feel the need to do so? 10. Do you feel anxious if you can't immediately contact your family members or friends? 11. Are you uneasy when you're, you know that your family members or friends can't reach you? 12. Are you nervous when you can't receive phone calls and texts from uh, whoever that may be? 13. Are you anxious if you can't get into touch with family members and friends whenever you need to? 14. Are you nervous because you think that someone might be trying to reach you? 15. Are you uneasy when you don't have a constant, consistent connection with family and friends? 16. Do you feel anxious because you are disconnected from your online identity? 17. Do you feel uncomfortable if you're not up to date with what's happening on social media or other online networks? 18. Do you get a strange feeling when you can't check your notifications for updates on social media? 19. Do you feel scared when you can't read your emails? And 20. Do you feel strange because you don't know what to do? I don't know if you were marking yourself on this quiz as you followed along, but as I said before, uh, if you answered yes to at least 10 of these questions, then that means that you may be addicted to your smartphone and you may need to do something about it. Thank you.